Uh, I'm Dale Brocious. I'm the Chief Commercialization Officer for IACME and the Executive Director of the IACME Consortium. And uh, welcome to Innovation Insights. Just a quick uh, recap on what this is. It's our monthly webinar series. This is our fifth episode of this, which features key products and technologies from our industry members and R&D partners. Uh, we typically have presentations from you know, a small company, a large company, one research partner, which might be a university or national lab. You know, and any IAC member in good standing is eligible to present. So you just need to get in touch with me to, to, to do that. Uh, this year, our real focus in IACME is around three themes, convene, connect, and catalyze, or three Cs, which is bringing people together, <clears throat> connecting those people to each other, people with needs, with people with solutions, and then catalyzing the activity between them to grow this composites industry. And it's surrounded by a lot of activities that IACME undertakes to make that happen. We are what we believe a connected community. These are pictures from, from previous uh, members' meetings where we've Brought a lot of people together. Uh, we've had two virtual meetings in the last year, and uh, that's about to change. Uh, October 5th through the 7th, this is, this is our future schedule for Innovation Insights. We'll be doing this live in Detroit, in Dearborn, Michigan, um, next month on October 5th through the 7th. So we're going to bring the industry together. We're going to reconvene. We believe we can do that in a safe fashion. And then there will be the webinar will resume again in November and December. So here's a little bit about the fall members meeting at the Henry Hotel in Dearborn. It's a, it's a beautiful hotel, a great facility, lots of space there. Uh, you can register if you haven't already at iacme.org slash fall 2021. We will have a Wednesday night reception at uh, the Henry Ford Museum. This is a fantastic museum. We have the run of the museum. Nobody else will be there. It's ours to ourselves. And uh, you know, obviously, if you want to social distance, this is one place where you can definitely do it. You know, it's an you know, enormous museum. We'll be having tours of the surf facility, the scale-up research facility in, in Detroit um, on Thursday afternoon. You know, again, full-scale equipment there. I know some of the people on this, you know, our presenters today and some of you, uh, many of you that are in the uh, audience have been there before. Just a little bit about uh, you know the safety. We are very conscious of the COVID pandemic and are going to conduct conduct that meeting in a very safe fashion. Again, with things like masks, sanitizers, uh, safe food and beverage service, um, and then we will be using a, a red, green, red, yellow, and green um, tag system on your badge. That uh, you know, red means you know. I mean, I'd like to keep my distance. Yellow says you know. We can we can connect with, with uh, some precautions and Green says hey I'm good for good for a handshake or uh, you know in a close conversation so uh, we will we will respect everybody's uh, priorities there. Just talk about our today's presenters. We have uh, Kevin and Haley Marie Keith. They're co-founders of Mito Materials in the um, graphene oxide space. Um, Lucy Hutchins and Dustin Davis from Norplex Advanced uh, Composites and Norplex Micarta some uh, new materials that, that, that they are bringing forward uh, to the marketplace in, in the continuous fiber space and pre-pregs. And Soydan Soy Ajan, who's our senior R&D scientist at Ridge National Laboratory, addressing uh, some new innovations, new equipment and capabilities at Oak Ridge to support the uh, circular economy and recycling space. So with that, I will uh, you know, turn it over to Kevin Keith to share his screen and we will get started. I would ask that um, if you've got some questions, please put them in the chat. We will get to them uh, as soon as each speaker is, has completed. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Dale. I really appreciate it. Uh, so let me share my screen really quick. Okay. Everybody see it? Awesome. Uh, so as Dale mentioned, my name is Kevin Keith. I am the uh, co-founder and CTO of Mito Material Solutions. And on the line with me, I also have Haley Keith, uh, CEO and also co-founder. You want to take it away from here? Yeah, thanks everyone. So um, we're really excited to share what we're doing here at Mito Materials, where we develop material hybrid additives for polymer, manufacturer, polymer manufacturers to enhance product performance. Uh, so many of you have seen what we did in, in the short presentation last year. Um, we're really expanding our product portfolio right now, and Kevin is going to show you a little bit about 
what we've learned in this graphene oxide space while developing these hybrid polymer additives, ut utilizing graphene oxide as a scaffold to um, functionalize it with silica particle, silica cage structures, and what that means in a variety of different materials, and then what that can translate to in the industry. Yeah, so at Minor Materials, uh, we make functional additives. So what that means is that we can plug and play different ingredients, different physical materials to make very robust usable additives. So uh, our initial process is where we use graphene oxide as our physical scaffold, and we're able to pair that with different uh, POS cage structures. So it's a organic, inorganic uh, silane cage structure with different polymer functionization sites to where you can either have uh, epoxide functionality, methyl acrylic functionality, and if you wanna get really crazy, uh, isobutyl. Uh, it is a single batch process that is really versatile. So you can swap out different ingredients. Uh, we can actually control the spacing between the graphene oxide platelets. So we can either uh, make them collapse really hard for whatever reason, uh, or you can blow it wide open and you can keep that surface area extremely uh, uh, wide. Uh, we have a high output and we have two issued patents with an exclusive license from Oklahoma State University. Uh, we actually filed one last month and we should be filing two more in the next couple of months. So with Mito Materials, uh, our first product is what we call Ego, which is where we have that graphene oxide uh, platelet paired with that uh, epoxide cage structure. So we've designed all of our materials to be very, very reactive. Uh, you don't need any change in your manufacturing or integration process. It is a very easy plug and play uh, dispersion additive. Uh, we go in at a very, very low concentration. Uh, we go in at 0.1%. We've even seen some product improvements at 0.05% as well. Uh, so we don't add any weight to the end product. Uh, due to the chemical functional sites on our additives, it's reactive dispersion. So it blends out very, very nicely. Uh, I've done this on site with a drill and paint mixer from Lowe's. So it's, it's very easy to use on site. And considering that the dry particle size is micron, and then it disperses out to submicron, uh, it is non-hazardous. So you can wear standard personal protection equipment with like an N95 uh, with safety glasses, totally fine. Uh, so ego we've geared more towards uh cases right so thermosets thermoplastics coatings and adhesives and we are actually seeing what it does in lubricants right now with a couple of different people uh we have designed ego to perform best in fiber reinforced systems uh, that is because with the additional functional sites it brings those fibers closer together to the the polymer that it interacts with uh, we've tested this in polyester, vinyl ester, and epoxy, and we've gotten some really, really great results with that. Uh, anywhere between 20 and 135% increase in mechanical performance, which we'll go over in a little bit. Uh, we've seen not only mechanical performance increases, but thermal conductivity and electrical insulation counterintuitively. Uh, so, oh, give me one second. Okay. Uh, so, we have not sectioned ourselves off to a specific market with ego what we're here to do within mino materials is have certain mechanical properties solved uh, flex tensile compression which means from there you can go into sporting goods automotive uh you know electric vehicles lubricating oils really the sky's the limit with this and that is because the dispersion profile is micron in in very viscous systems right so it's really easy to integrate, but because of the functional chemistry that is on there, you don't need a totally, quote, homogenous dispersion. Uh, with traditional graphene, you need to exfoliate it really, really, really intensely, and then you need to have a very specific dispersion profile to even get it to work. Generally, whenever graphene is involved within product development, it takes years. Uh, we've had customers do this in months just because of the functional sites on there. So the optical image that you're seeing here, this is within EPON 828, which is 11,000 centipoids. Uh, we originally dispersed into a master batch with a three row mill at a 1% and then left that down to a 0.1% with a shear mixer. So the particle size is roughly, the largest particle size is about 34 microns, 
but the chemical functionality makes up for that to where we get some large increases. And so looking at the TGA, uh, we don't affect the thermal degradation of the polymers that we go into. And we've seen this across the board, whether it's thermoplastics, thermosets, uh, coatings, adhesives, it remains totally the same. So we don't affect the curing profile, the gel time, viscosity, anything like that, because we go in at such a low concentration. Uh, as you can see here from some nylon six samples, we did some SEM imaging uh, within some pellets and the largest particle we could see in, across, it was like 15 different samples was 27 microns. Now, whenever we were compounded into this, even though you had this 27 micron particle size maximum, uh, we increased the processing of the nylon. So even though we use the same compounding profile, compounding temperature, it cleaned up way easier than anything else on the market. And this is from customers out in the field. This isn't from us internally. Uh, again, because of the functional chemistry that is involved. And so we produced some mechanical results with that EPON 828. Uh, we saw that with that 828 paired with a uh, standard Epicure 3370, it's about a uh, 100 to 50 ratio. Uh, we saw that average increases with this uh, is about 11%, whether it's toughness, area under the curve, of uh, max flex stress, flex modulus. But not only did the modulus and strength increase, but we also increased the stiffness by about 6%, which is really interesting. Usually that doesn't happen. Now, with, of course, EPON 828, that is a very, very base material. And so we see these you know single double digit increases here but whenever we put it out into the field with customers whether it's polyester vinyl ester or other types of more complicated epoxies these results drastically increase and that's because they have more functional sites to grab onto those esters and all that type of stuff uh, within that same epon 828 uh, we did some electrical conductivity testing with carbon fiber involved and we saw that whether it's the volumetric or surface conductivity, it dropped anywhere between 68% and 86%. Uh, and that's held true across nylon 6.6, bio-based epoxies, polyester, you name it. Counterintuitively, we increased the thermal conductivity within polyester. Uh, we did not test this with fiber reinforcement because this was a really quick study, uh, but this was a, a, to an ASTM standard, I think it was like C157 or something like that. We saw the thermal conductivity increase by 19 and a half percent. We're doing some other studies with EGO and some other uh, polymer systems right now as well. And that could lead to some really interesting applications uh, like maybe potentially some storage type devices or being used as a uh, epoxy within circuit boards, that sort of thing. And so some anticipated properties we we are studying right now, uh, increased UV resistance because of the POS and the silane base structure, uh, corrosion resistance due to the imparted electrical properties that were decreased uh, due to the uh, decreased ion exchange. The abrasion resistance should also go up considering we increase the toughness and then the hydrophobic phyllic properties, uh, we believe uh, again, studying that, considering you have to put it in a bucket for 12 months, uh, we believe we're going to make it more hydrophobic. Uh, that one is also ongoing with a couple of customers, and fingers crossed we'll get some results soon. Haley, if you want to. What does it take all it mean for here? industry? Yeah. Yes. Thanks. So, what does that all mean for industry? Uh, material science is a very wonderful, exciting, and confusing thing at times, as we all know. Um, but what we found at Mido is that most people in different industry use the same uh, same types of materials, and we are designing Ego and our various other hybrid additives to integrate into the general systems themselves, so that any industry using any of these materials will be able to integrate and see the benefit. So in one, in one case, a uh, semi-truck trailer manufacturer is looking to transition away from metal side panels and metal flooring all the way to composites. And the biggest issue they can't have is a forklift falling through the trailer floor. So they're running into some challenges, choosing the right materials. As we all know, there's so much variety in composites, um, but their end goals were 40 to 50% uh, reduction in weight, around 40% reduction in emissions and maintaining the same load capacity. 
Mido entered into this project as an opportunity to increase the toughness and uh, compression and flex for the trailer floors. And here you see an ultrasonic check for a very uniform dispersion of our additive into their polyester system um, with a simple drill mix attached uh, on site. This was that, that dispersion was happened in-house um, at the facility using a simple shear mix. So the uniform dispersion on these ultrasonic panels and the test results that we gained thereafter showed an increase from Mito plus polyester, 135% increase in flex modulus over the vinyl ester opportunity that they were, that they were evaluating. Uh, we see also improvements in compressive load per inch, flexural peak load, and overall compressive strength and tensile peak load leading to a longer estimated fatigue life. So this was using um, chop fiber mats and, uh, Techno, uh, and polyester resin systems. And we're continuing these studies, sorry, thank you. <laughs> um, and we are continuing these studies using the hand layup and fiberglass reinforced systems that they were looking at too. Um, these studies are ongoing. Everyone was very excited about the flexural modulus and we're continuing flex fatigue, corrosion resistance and weatherability on these panels in order to let them transition, allow them to transition away from metals and into composites utilizing in this one specific use case. Another use case that Mido has recently gotten into is sporting goods and equipment. Uh, so Folsom Custom Skis approached us with this opportunity of utilizing graphene in their fiberglass and carbon fiber reinforced ski system to increase flex loading anywhere between, their goal was uh, upwards of 10% and also an, a decrease in weight. What they found when we sent them 10 grams of Mido material was that they were able to make three sets of skis and test them over a six month period. They sent one set of skis to Doug, professional skier uh, pictured here, and he tested them out, one with ego, one without ego on the slopes in backcountry ski settings, and was basically very excited about the opportunity that graphene provided in our functional additives because it was like being handed the keys to a full F1 car. They were able to go faster, um, skate or ski down the slope without chatter, and respond better to the slopes as you're navigating downwards. What our six month trial showed was that at less than 1% loading, the dampening increased significantly and killed board chatter on the hard snow, increasing the dampening properties and stiffening the vibration. We were also able to get a more flexible ski and a lighter ski, which made them extremely excited to pursue Mido powered skis on their next iteration in the 2021 ski line. We're working with several other partners in the sporting and recreational goods industry that are looking for these properties. But what I think was really cool about this, this opportunity in both the semi-truck trailers and the ski manufacturer is that they're using the same product and they're getting same results if better results specific for their industry using different, different resins, but same core materials, right? It's always resin, always a fiber or glass or a carbon fiber mixture. And e Ego's properties are able to answer the needs of an industry. And so being, of course, a chemical materials company, uh, we're not just a one trick pony. We are actually launching a new product this year at Camex, uh, where we are swapping out that graphene oxide scaffold for a high amulose cornstarch. Uh, seems counterintuitive, I will admit. Uh, but our process has actually shown that with the addition of a POS structure, uh, we're getting about the same mechanical results, if not better, at a 0.5% loading. Now, you'll see here an optical image that when we, we loaded it into the system the same exact way, 1% master batch on three-roll mill, uh, let down to a 0.5% all in an EPON 828, uh, we can't see it. It, it disperses out so well, despite being a, a hard handling uh, granular size, still micron, it disperses out to nano size. So uh, this has gotten a lot of us really excited. Uh, it's gotten a lot of customers out in the uh, coatings and adhesives field pumped because this does not affect the optical clarity, but you're still getting these large performance increases at very, very low loadings. So uh, next month, Camex should be launching that and we'll have more information soon. And so with these two products in mind, we're enabling the next generation of materials uh, by making performance composite components made, you know, either of bio-based or recycled materials uh, to hit the market hard and fast. Uh, 
potentially we can make enhanced battery casings to replace metal plates. Uh, we have a couple of prepared customers working on that with our material right now. And overall, I mean, pipe dream. Uh, with the addition of Ego, we could make next generation rope dampening materials by integrating it directly into the structure to take place of the heavy rubbers and all the other materials in the car. Uh, you know, whether it's the, the frame, the panels, you name it, we could make that into road dampening material. So thank you so much for giving, letting us um, do this presentation with you guys today. I hope that you've seen an tremendous, tremendous amount of growth. We're excited to kind of preview our newest addition to the Mido product portfolio here with you today. Um, and I, I think what Kevin and I are really here to do is to make these additives to enhance materials for a better tomorrow and continue to educate the industry on the cutting edge technology that additives can provide to composites. But ultimately, it's important to remember that we don't make anything. We don't make cars. We don't make uh, composites. Uh, we just make them better. And we want to help you make your products better by looking at what Mito has to offer and, and, and integrating different additives into the space for multifunctional purposes, which I think is a very important next step in the composites journey. So we're super excited to answer any questions. I think I did see one in the chat that Kevin can go ahead and um, take a hit on. Yeah, what I'd suggest here in order to keep going on time is, is you know, just respond in the chat. There's a Q&A okay. window as well as a panelist and, and uh, just respond there. I've got a couple of questions, but I'm going to put them in the Q&A and you can okay. answer them live, you know, during the next presentation that way so that we can we can uh, keep the moving on and try to get done by by noons or by one. Sorry. Perfect. Okay. Thank you both. Uh, great stuff. And by the way, I think BASF already took the line. We don't make the products you use we make the products you use better but they did still they did have that back in the 90s but it's not trademarked <laughs> all right yeah, good deal okay so uh you know we're going to move on to our next uh, set of speakers from norplex micarta norplex advanced composites lucy the floor is yours thank you let me just make sure that i get this going great Great. Hi, everyone. My name is Lucy Houchin. I'm um, really pleased to be with you this afternoon or this morning, depending on where you are. Um, so I'm here with my uh, colleague, Dustin Davis, um, and we're going to um, tell you a little bit about uh, Norplex Micarta. Um, hopefully, um, some of you know about us already, um, but we'll be sharing um, some exciting new announcements about Norplex Advanced Composites, which is a new venture from the Norplex Group. Um, that we can share with you today. Um, but we'll spend the majority of the time talking about Norply um, and um, the, uh, this great application or this great material for um, high fatigue loads. Uh, um, so let's dive in then to Norplex Micarta. Um, like I said, hopefully some of you are familiar with Norplex Micarta. We've been around for quite a while. Um, uh, but for those who are not, uh, we are a developer and manufacturer of thermoset composites. So we make a lot of prepregs, um, typically with epoxy and phenolic uh, chemistries, um, and we put those on a lot of uh, or a wide range of reinforcements. Um, however, most of what we sell is actually sold as cured sheets, uh, tubes, and stock shapes. Um, we do this from three different, well, from two different facilities. I'll uh, get to our third facility uh, on the next slide. Um, but two facilities, one in Iowa, one in China, and we have over 300 stock, uh, standard products. Um, however, what um, Dustin and I really have fun with <laughs> is uh, kind of new, new material development. So we have um, applications engineering support um, and then a, a suite of material characterization capabilities and um, a team of uh, technical folks who are really uh, eager to work with you on material development for new products. Um, so what we're really excited about today, though, however, is to give you a sneak peek at the launch of Norplex Advanced Composites. Um, so officially, Norplex Advanced will launch next week. <laughs> so you guys are getting kind of the, the first look at it here today. Um, and Norplex Advanced Composites um, really is an expansion of Norplex's uh, capabilities, um, specifically our prepregging capabilities, and kind of a doubling down of our commitment to the advanced composite space. Um, so we are really excited and kind of the whole goal with this is to help customers create value through advanced composite materials. Um, we've positioned ourselves um, through the investments we've made 
uh, to provide cost effective composite solutions. Um, and we're really aimed at doing this at kind of mid market volumes um, or even high volume applications, but kind of mid market is, is the sweet spot that we're going for. Um, and uh, we're really excited to work with customers through kind of all stages of the product development process, whether that's um, kind of new designs or even uh, process improvement, uh, process challenges that you're having. So um, Norplex Advanced Composites is, you know, kind of fresh off the, fresh off the, um, the line, I guess. And um, as evidence of that, uh, this is our uh, kind of new facility that we're opening next week. I'm actually sitting in it now, so it's technically open, but a uh, new facility uh, located outside of Bozeman, Montana. Um, so maybe we can get some of those skis that Haley and uh, Kevin were talking about uh, to test out. <laughs> um, this will give us um, 32,000 additional square feet of manufacturing space, uh, which will house a new direct impregnation uh, hot melt coating line. So um, first off the line will be a unidirectional glass epoxy product, uh, which uh, Dustin will be talking about uh, specifically in a few, in a few slides. Um, but what I'd like to note here is that um, while this glass epoxy product will be the first kind of focus um, off the line, we are actively looking for um, new partners that have um, you know, new product development uh, needs. So we'll, uh, you know, we're happy to work with you on those and, um, and have the capabilities to do so. Um, this is kind of what this, how this translates into the market and kind of specific products. Um, some on the call may be familiar with um, EnableX, which is a prepreg molding system that was launched by Norplex Micarta, I guess a couple of years ago by now. We're still very much focused on that uh, and we'll be uh, continuing to offer that and promote that under the Norplex Advanced Composites brand. Um, and then with the new line in Montana, we have the ability to really expand our prepreg offering. Um, so we'll be you know, offering those advanced prepregs, um, whether they're unidirectional or fabric um, composites uh, from the facility here in Montana, but also continuing to offer those um, kind of solvent-based um, processes uh, through our Iowa facility as well. And then the third pillar of our product portfolio is Norply, which, is, um, which are uh, fatigue-resistant laminates and which I'll turn it over to uh, Dustin Davis to talk about further. Dustin? Yeah, thanks, Lucy. I appreciate all the introduction. So uh, hi, everyone. It's a, a pleasure to be here with you today. Really appreciated uh, Mido's uh, uh, presentation and a focus on fatigue, uh, because that's where we're going to spend the next few minutes. So uh, as Lucy introduced, Norplex Micarta has been making prepreg uh, under the Micarta brand for over 100 years. But that's always been fabric-based. Uh, we have uh, successfully launched some uh, materials based upon non-crimp fabrics, which then allow us to get very flat fibers and do multi-axial layups in our uh, materials. But the problem with non-crimp fabrics, of course, is that they are in fact stitched. So the Norply uh, product line is based upon a traditional and pure unidirectional uh, glass epoxy. We do that right now with e-glass where we could easily do it with uh, other glass reinforcements. We provide that obviously as a unidirectional sheet, uh, do it in a cross ply format. And then the quasi isotropic we run is typically a four layer uh, zero plus minus 45 and a 90. Now Norply is, is a continuation of uh, some product lines that, that were uh, most recently owned by Solvay under the SciPly line and by 3M uh, under the Scotchply line. So, for many of you, uh, this name may sound new, but this technology and, and what we're doing with it here uh, is a continuation of some work that's already been done. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So these um, materials have some very interesting uh, properties that, that compared to other continuous fiber reinforced unidirectional you know, type, uh, uh, their competitive products, uh, really do stand ahead. And, but more importantly, if we zoom out for a second and talk about why in the world would we ever use a composite uh, in a spring application, particularly in vibratory freezing systems or in couplings, um, the reason is that this is a great application to take advantage of the anisotropy that composites have. So designers that work with these materials are actually using the fact that the material will behave differently uh, when excited in the different axes. And um, we, we typically supply these as a unidirectional type 
for most of these applications, but of course there are some cross plies in there uh, to, to hold the material together. Um, the, the balance and challenge when, when working with these applications is to essentially balance the fatigue load, as you can imagine. The traditional approach to that would be simply to add material, but as you add material, you reduce um, the amount that the material will bend for the same amount of force. And as a spring, it must move through a certain range in order to do its job. So uh, there's a, a series of services we provide to customers to help them size these springs, design them in packs, um, and essentially take what is a unidirectional material, determine a layup, build a sheet, and then help people access fully machined parts. So um, over here are the key characteristics that, that I'm sure you can read through. Many of them are common to composites, but we find that you know, it's, it's the fatigue life, the high impact strength, and again, in certain applications, the ability to really alter how the dynamics of the machine occur by taking advantage of the, the anisotropy. So these are commonly used in heavy vibratory equipment. Um, there's an entire product line that's also based upon uh, insulated rail joints for extreme uh, heavy fatigue load applications where it also needs to be an insulator to separate different sections of the track. Uh, dynamic couplings are uh, another significant application where um, standard steel uh, couplings or materials um, just don't allow for the same degree of misalignment. So in some very high speed, high precision um, devices where you know there's going to be offsets that occur, these materials are completely uh, the, the material of choice. Some other areas that, that have been applications in the past and ones that we're gonna be looking to bring some material innovation to um, are in, in like dock shelter staves where you're having trucks that are constantly backing up and, and creating a, a, flex, a flex fatigue load. Um, and then any kind of spring, and I'll leave some of that, um, particularly leaf spring type for, for Lucy later. So uh, given this is a, a technical audience, Lucy, if we could go to the next uh, slide, thank you. We do have uh, SN curves, and for those of you who are familiar with these, I'm sure they make sense, but let me just uh, explain real quick that essentially um, these are curves that show you how much uh, force or stress you could put in and, and how many cycles you would have then to failure. So if these extended all the way out to the zero point, the farthest left, this is starting at 10 to the three, but if we did one, that would essentially be your static test, right? You would just flex it until it broke. And then these curves here are showing you at room temperature, the kind of cycles you can expect till failure. When we typically um, talk about this with customers, we plan people around a fatigue life of around 20,000 PSI. So again, the, the challenge is to divide, design something that can handle 20,000 PSI, but yet still create the right amount of movement uh, to work in the material handling. So uh, there's, this is just one of our pieces of data. There's many more that are available on our website, but we wanted to share that we already have this SN data. If you're looking to do any uh, design work uh, with a glass epoxy as a, a leaf spring or some other kind of high fatigue application. So uh, thanks, Lucy. I, I think it's yours again. Thanks. That was quick, Dustin. You're usually not so concise. <laughs> I, um, yeah, I'll just put a kind of a fine point on some of the, the things that we want to leave you with here. Um, and, and that would be three, three main things, um, in addition to the, the great information that Dustin shared. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like um, to leave you with, you know, the, the notion that Norflex Advanced Composites, um, you know, we're offering a proven and also growing product portfolio. Um, so we have uh, Norfly and EnableX and a suite of uh, prepregs that we are currently offering, but we're, we're really um, kind of excited about um, developing new solutions with our partners. Um, collaboration is core to kind of everything that we do um, at Norplex. Um, and so we, you know, uh, take this um, very seriously, but also um, have a lot of fun with it too. So um, please, you know, um, think of us if you have a new solution or a, a new challenge that you're, you're looking at um, uh, for a solution for. Um, we're also um, thinking of ourselves as kind of a startup venture. Um, you know, we have, we draw on the experience and leadership of uh, Norplex Micarta and the long history that, um, that, that we have there, but we also um, are very, you know, agile and um, kind of quick as a startup venture here at Norplex Advanced Composites. So if you're looking for kind of a quick uh, ramp up time or, you know, someone who's willing to kind of 
just dig in and, um, and kind of say, why not? Um, that's us. Um, and please think of us that way. Um, and we're ready to engage with you kind of at all stages of the product development process, whether that's, as I mentioned earlier, the design process or, you know, all, all through a, you know, kind of existing product you have and are looking for some process improvement or uh, kind of process addressing process challenges. So, you know, we're really, we have a team here that's ready to engage with you. Um, so please keep this in mind. Um, I'll also say that Dustin and I are going to be, you know, making the kind of fall meeting circuit. <laughs> So um, look for us at the IACME members meeting uh, in a couple of weeks, um, but also at CAMEX and ACC and all of those, we'd be happy to, uh, to meet with you and talk with you further or, you know, don't hesitate to get in touch here. And that's all we have, Dale. Yeah, thanks, Lucy. Thanks, Dustin. I, I, we got a couple of minutes for questions and I have a couple. Oh. Sure. If Sorry, okay. I didn't mean to stop sharing. <laughs> hey, that's all right. Yeah, you didn't mean to stop sharing, but it's, it's okay. Um, a uh, question about um, aerial weight range product with slit slitting. Do you, you know? Are you doing those kinds of things as well? What you know? What's the minimum, maximum aerial weight and, and uh, the width of the product? Justin, you want to take that one? So I'm talking about the Norply, obviously. Yeah. Right. So, so, you know, we don't define uh, Norply by an aerial weight once it's in a cured laminate, and I should, should emphasize that. So we're producing that in four by six foot sheets. We make a product right now that's already up to an inch and five sixteenths thick, I believe. And uh, I think we can go up to almost, an, uh, almost two inches on that. So some of the applications like your rail joints are extremely heavy. The vast majority of the applications in the spring market are going to be, you know, 187 to quarter inch. Um, there are applications in, say, the uh, agricultural area, for instance, nut harvesting, uh, where you can use things that are a quarter to a half inch. They need they they need that additional, um, you know, thickness, and they can still hit their vibration frequencies and things. So. Um, Typical sheet product, uh, once we make it, we can cut it down to whatever size you need. We have ways of marking the primary fiber axis so that can uh, be maintained through the fabrication steps. And if we need to develop additional layups or thickness capabilities, those are things uh, well within our wheelhouse. Okay, so this is a, so you're, you're doing this somewhere to the postville plant where that's using fabric pre breaks and you're laminating them. Whereas here, this will be unidirectional laminated pre breaks that you'll be doing in Montana. Will you be, you know, will you be offering uh, any unidirectional forms of Enable X? You know, in other words, uncured pre preg as well? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Oh, sorry, Dustin, I don't mean to step on you. No, you go um, right ahead. Yeah, no, most definitely, Dale. Um, you know, with Enable X, it's a pre preg molding system where we're, um, we're offering um, a pre preg, but also a molding compound that is compatible. You know, the compatibility is the key. Uh, when it comes to the EnableX product line. So yes, we would be in a position to offer the prepreg and then work with partners to supply some sort of compatible molding compound. Um, and whether that's a unidirectional or fabric, you know, we have um, uh, under EnableX, we have a, a currently a phenolic solution, a vinyl ester solution, and, um, and we can develop others. Or, or we are developing others as well. Sure, okay. So and, uh, any, just... plan, any plans to use, to, to do this with carbon? The short answer is yes. Okay. <laughs> the Good. the the longer answer is yes, but in time. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah, Dale. So I I, I think what I would do for for those who are on the call, um, you know, the Norplex Micarta line really is being reimagined as all about cured products. Um, this Nor the Norplex Advanced is keeping the Norply because it is truly unique and, and all about unidirectional. You know, but when you think about our Norplex Advanced line, it is a commitment to the advanced composite space, working with prepregs, working with customers more collaboratively early in the design process. Whereas the Norplex Micarta brand uh, is sort of, it's about sheets and tubes and fully cured shapes. So right. uh, all the things that we've tried to do, we're, we're just doing it now with a dedicated team focused in on really homing in on prepreg development. So all of our prepregs, Lucy is uh, going to be leading the effort on that. Okay, great. All right, thank you very much for the invigorating presentation, and good luck on the uh, the grand opening. Uh, it's about a, two weeks away, yeah, week and a half about away. 10 day, about ten days. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Congratulations on that, and I'm looking forward, you know, to getting out to Big Sky and uh, and stopping in to see you. You know, at some Sounds point. Sounds great.
Sounds okay. Good. All right, good. So we'll move on to our third and uh, final presentation of the day. It's uh, Soedan Ashan from, from uh, Oak Ridge National Labs. And, uh, you know, they've put in some great capabilities during the pandemic uh, to address circular economy and, and recycling. And uh, he's going to uh, share some of that with all of us. Soedan? Thank you, Dale. Can you hear my slides? Can you see my slides? Sorry. Don't hear, don't hear the slides, but uh, all right. uh, they're talking. <laughs> Obviously, you are hearing me. Hey, uh, hey uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, the, I'm Soydan Özyan. I'm a senior scientist at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. I've been working with IACME for been six years now uh, around the circular economy activities for composite materials. So I'm going to go through some, uh, you know, general uh, big uh, uh, issue, magnitude of the issue with regarding to composite materials and then uh, technology gaps. We'll go through to some uh, ORNL facilities that uh, and give you some couple of example research and uh, give you some example of how you can collaborate in these areas with Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And today I'll touch base, uh, you know, to to discuss, to, to, to tell you that what's the magnitude of the composite uh, issue today. Uh, composite is a, a high performance, uh, you know, low density, very valuable material in a clean energy applications. Every year demand for composites uh, in the sustainable energy sector is, is keep increasing by over 10%. And it's expected to increase next decade, decade as well. Uh, unlike conventional, conventional plastics, composite manufacturing, either for electric vehicles or wind technology, where we use for the uh, clean energy, has a, has a significant the more greenhouse gas emission, which is calculated about up to 106 kilogram CO2 per kilogram uh, composite. So based on the, some estimation, if we can recover uh, effectively and cost effectively uh, carbon fiber. Uh, it is expected to be uh, take place in the uh, automotive industry by uh, 4.1 million metric tons uh, 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 tons per year by 2040. This is a this is a significant amount of use for a recycled carbon fiber uh, uh, in an automotive industry and significant benefit for the particularly EV applications. So uh, it's also uh, for the wind energy, it is expected to over sevenfold increase in demand of carbon fiber for offshore wind turbine blades in next decade, because we have seen that significant increase uh, on the, uh, we will see the significant increase on the offshore wind turbine blade manufacturing and utilization. So uh, carbon fiber is becoming more and more important in a longer and uh, bigger wind turbine blades. So uh, when we look at the, you know, this three area, uh, wind, wind energy, uh, aerospace, and automotive, these are the main uh, consumer of the carbon, uh, glass and carbon fiber uh, composite. Also, I would like to touch base some couple of projects around large area and manufacturing. You see on this picture on the middle, this is actually a printed wind turbine blade mold utilizing the carbon fiber ABS materials. Uh, it's a huge uh, wind turbine blade, and we have plans to do, uh, you know, um, developing new type of uh, molds for a wind turbine blade. And what you see building at the bottom is the uh, uh, one side. Uh, this is a Domino Sugar building built at uh, Brooklyn, uh, New York, and one side of the building is completely made with uh, uh, with the uh, from a precast concrete mold which has been made by the edible manufactured, uh, manufactured molds. So uh, there is a lot, about 30,000 pounds of material is being used. So we are looking at how we can recycle, reuse that. So when we look at the uh, amount of uh, the magnitude of the problem, uh, why so little is recycled? Why is not being collected? Why they are being landfilled today? And why do we use always in the automotive or other application virgin materials instead of we don't choose the recycled material? So there is a wide range of, when we look at the logistic challenges, uh, there is no wide range of existing recycling technologies that can achieve the cost parity. And there is no true supply chain developed. And wind energy and automotive are part of large 
complex multi-material systems by design they are already complex and when we look at the technical problem we got to develop new type of cost effective recycling technologies that can utilize these materials and uh, of course uh, the, there need to be strategies to how you size reduce this big huge uh, maybe wind turbine blade or malt or others on the location so it will enable the transportation or, or our other logistic activities so um, how we approach the solution so first uh, when we need to look at it such a way that uh, the material or the design uh, design for the part or the material that we use needs to be renewable and inherently recyclable material. So that's, we, you know, uh, we, uh, this is the uh, important part of it to choose the correct material and correct design. The second part of it is, you know, uh, composite 4.0, I said, you know, industry moving is a manufacturing 4.0. What are the circular solutions that we can create around the composite industry? This is a creating a, a you know innov innovative tracing uh, technologies or how you can reuse uh, product and create the flow and uh, some kind of cloud-based data analysis that can go into the uh, in a common system every manufacturer can pull this information and see logistically where are those materials and where is the closest recycling uh, center what would be the optimum case to use these materials this kind of uh, circular solutions that we have to create to enable to uh, compose material recycle and design for uh, design and techniques for recyclability is the third level of it and and the fourth level we have to learn how to recycle with the current material up to that point we wanted to make everything easy to recycle and then if we have a current material to deal how we are going to recycle them. They are not designed for recyclability by, by starting with. And the fifth one that you see on this one is the value of feedstock from hard to recycle waste. If you cannot recycle, then how you are going to create the uh, uh, value out of that by minimizing the leakage to the environment, which is which goes into the uh, converting them to the oil, converting to upgrading to the uh, um, marine uh, fuel or, or other options. So these are the five steps that we have to take into action. And when we look at, as I mentioned, first innovation is design for sustainability and create a common digital platforms that you can reutilize. Particularly, I'm showing these wind turbine blades as well as the automotive. And the main problem in here is, uh, as you see in this, uh, you don't want to get in this box. You don't, this is the recycling uh, recycling part of it. Before coming into the recycling box, we need to find solutions that are easy to dismantle, easy to reuse, easy to remanufacture pathways for these materials. However, once we are in this box, as you see in the automotive case, how you separate, how you classify, there is tremendous technologies that we got to work on separation and classification. Next step is uh, once it is separated and classified, it's similar to wind turbine, it's similar to any other application too, because uh, when you look at the wind blades, there's a balsa wood, there's a composite, there's a carbon fiber, glass fiber, and other, other, other additives there, but the automotive is much more complex. So separation and classification, how we can readily reuse this material. I'm going to come back to this point, why we want to reuse it right away, instead of going all the, all the back to the monomers and so on. So uh, what's the mechanical recycling pathways for us? The third is, if you are not able to do it, so we gotta recycle them. What are the chemical, uh, biological, enzymatic deconstruction of these materials, uh, low energy and low cost uh, methods that we can utilize. So the second one is post-processing, uh, reusable polymer creating and reusable fiber creating and then I upcycle to high value sustainable composite products. This is the remanufacturing. However, while remanufacturing that to the new product, the critical point is it's going back to the first innovation. Now new product has to be designed for recyclability, reusability. So that should not gonna be again, the same product development. It's a new design that will enable to recycling in the next time, uh, make it easy. So when we look at this pyramid, 
there is a different level of plastics problem available uh, worldwide. Uh, commodity plastics, you know, ocean uh, 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 pollution, and and we have heard about it uh, many many aspect of it. When we look at the functional components, these are uh, uh, phones, computers, or medical devices, uh, e-waste, and then. Actually, fiber reinforced plastic polymers is sitting at the top of the pol uh, at the top of this uh, pyramid. The reason that I'm showing that when we look at the value of it, uh, recovering the glass, recovering the carbon fiber, or reutilizing that, it's already is a huge value. Starting developing technologies at the top of the pyramid and tackling down uh, other other areas will be the best pathway to tackle with the big plastic problem. So. Uh, that's the reason that finding solutions, finding technologies, as I mentioned previously, starting with the fiber reinforced plastics are going to be the critical to solve the problems with the functional components as well as the commodity plastics. So how we will know that this is going to be successful, where we are going to going ahead, where we are heading to. Uh, when we look at the recovery, number one is it has to be cost effective to create the uh, economical impact and feasibility of the business. And energy saving is the part of it. There's a significant energy saving is possible by reusing instead of recreating these materials. And similarly, up to 75% reduction is possible in, in terms of carbon footprinting in a different, uh, different type of uh, thermoplastics uh, that can be confirmed with LCA and TEA. So let's look at this chart. We start to create the plastics from monomer, goes to oligomer, polymer, melt process. This can be print, this can be uh, manufactured to the, any, any composite and use. Each step requires its own energy and cost adding until we come to the end use. So if it is possible, uh, there are different pathways to recycle this material. So if it is possible, this needs to be anyway size reduced. First, how we can direct use this material in terms of the 3D printing direct granulate uh, use. And the second pathway is uh, repelletize and reuse. That's actually significantly less energy, less carbon footprint, and, uh, and less cost. However, uh, if not, we can go all the way to the monomer or oligomer, which will the chemical, enzymatic, and thermal, thermal recycling uh, opportunities. But the more we go, we got to rebuild this polymer, which is in, uh, uh, associated with additional energy cost and, and carbon footprint. So a couple of equipment updates from Oak Ridge. Uh, in Oak Ridge National Lab, we have a suite of equipments that can we can able to make many different composite, uh, uh, composite utilizing the different composite uh, making methodologies. Uh, we have on site uh, injection molder, 330 tons of injection molder, SMC line, uh, compression molder, 100 ton and 500 tons, both of them, and extruders, twin screw, single screw. We are able to process all different type of uh, polymers and composites. However, what you see is uniquely in this picture is uh, once we have received a big piece of material uh, or product, we can easily cut into the pieces using a water jet cutting tool on the left hand side. You see, uh, it's about eight to eight. Uh, uh, eight by 11 foot uh, cutting cutting bat. On the right hand side, you see a, a shredding equipment, which is 300 pound per hour. And there's a granulation of, uh, just follow up on this one. We can reduce further size down. Again, similar uh, throughput, 300 pound per hour. And uh, including in the set, there's a hammer mill, there's a other type of uh, milling or size reduction equipment uh, in this suite is available. On the right hand side, you see the twin screw extruder. This is about 250 pounds per hour. We can actually remanufacture anything, I mean, reprocess in component into the pallets, uh, what comes from this uh, uh, size reduced equipment. So I'll give you a couple of example uh, projects that uh, Oak Ridge National Lab running with their partners. One of them is I mentioned about this big mold on the right hand side. This is the printed board, actually, it's printed at University of Maine. Um, and these are all, and on the right hand side, this is the mold uh, for the precast concrete. All of them are 
uh, can be actually re size reduced and reused. Our target is uh, when it is size reduced, can we reach the 95% of them pass through the half, uh, half inch sieve, which is necessary for us to feed back into the extruder and we pelletize them. And we are working with the, uh, our analyst people to confirm the techno-economical analysis. Can we done the entire process from taking the material on site, uh, bringing to the uh, uh, size reduction facility, the cost of the size reduction facility, and then make it for all the process for $2.2 per kilogram. Originally, this material is sell for around $11 per kg. And um, if we are able to do below $2.2 per kg, there's a significant market reuse this material. Of course, there's a contamination and other parts of the issue that the Oak Ridge team is, is uh, targeting. And early numbers are showing that based on RTA, we are able to do it be below $2.2 per kg. Another one is this uh, precast concrete mold, as I mentioned. Um, this is the mold. Uh, can we reuse this mold? So once the work is done, it's about one or two months uh, time frame. You print it, you use it, it's done. It can be used many, many times. However, just for this purpose, just for the one building, it's done in a, a short period of time. And this mold can survive in a normal environment conditions for years, 400 years, maybe 300, 500. It's, it's just a guess, but it can survive very long time. After two months of use, how we can reutilize this, this product? So the goal is, can we uh, re-pelletize, uh, re shred it, granulate, re-pelletize? Can we use 20 times and still we have the dimensional stability as a mold? And we don't, we don't wanna see the any layer to layer delamination. So this is the one of the ongoing projects at ORNL. A another one is this, uh, uh, this is a high value product, which is PSU carbon fiber. Uh, thermoplastic mold. This has been uh, for an autoclave uh, application, which is an aerospace application. There's a significant amount of carbon fiber, about 40% is carbon fiber on this product. So can we reuse this product to make again, uh, print a remold or make another mold and uh, one more time uh, create a value of it, which is a specific conditions are necessary for that. Uh, which is 250 uh, Fahrenheit uh, uh, temperature and should able to 90 psi uh, pressure. So from from there, uh, I would like to just touch base on my last slide uh, to show you that how you uh, collaborate. How do you work with Oak Ridge National Lab? This is one of the mechanism. There is there out of out of many of them. Uh, this is the industry tech collaborations. We like to work very uh, in a quick pace with the industry partner. So there's a three step of it. We decide on a problem. We just develop a quick uh, a scope. And right after uh, there's a non-negotiable CREDA, there's a short CREDA. Uh, we can, both parties can uh, sign. First phase is 40,000, second phase is $200,000 if necessary, if we need to go to second phase. Uh, the funds are already available. Uh, in the uh, in Oak Ridge National Lab, so we still need to go to our DOE partner to get it uh, get the final approval. However, we can start this project so quick, quickly. There is no money uh, hands change. Uh, there is a one to one in kind cost share is required, or uh, cash or in kind cost share required from a partner. So that's the way you can uh, the industry partner can easily access to the. Uh, you know, skill set as well as the equipments available at Oak Ridge National Lab. We every year we start 20, 30 of them uh, at uh, manufacturing demonstration facility. And um, this is the one example of how we can work together. And our researchers are, you know, happy to discuss uh, any, any possible activity with you. So I'll stop here. Hopefully, I stay in the 15 to 20 minutes time frame. Okay, and you've taken us to the top of the hour, and uh, all right, you know, and and the question I was going to ask is how do people engage? But you explained that as, uh, as in your last slide there, and uh, you know, feel anybody on audience who wants to connect with any of our speakers today, feel free to reach out to us. We'll 
we'll connect you up. So just, just so you know that. Um, look forward to uh, seeing many of you at the mem members meeting in, uh, in three weeks. And then uh, we'll be back to the webinars in November and December. So thank all of you for attending. Thanks to our panelists and our speakers. A great presentations and a great variety in what we're doing here today. So again, thank you all and see you uh, next time. Oh, by Thanks the way, the, uh, oh, somebody did ask a question about the presentations being shared. We do record this and uh, those recordings are available through our website. So you'll be able to go back and review the recordings. And then if you want the presentations specifically, you know, we can, we can connect you to the, to the speakers to get those. Thanks okay. for the Thanks all. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone for attending for the opportunity. Bye now. Bye.